Welcome everyone. So glad to have you here today with me in the brand new year of 2023. It really seems funny to say. I know I'm going to slip up and say 2022 uh, probably several times a day. So Beth, you can just uh, correct me. We'll correct one another. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm so excited to have with me my guest, and I'm going to introduce her a little bit more, Beth Holland, and she is going to cover our topic about, are you ready for college? This is our very first Friday Forum in 2023 in January. So as you're joining us, please put your name in the chat so that Beth can see where you're from. And also you can see each other. This is one of the things that I like about Zoom is that we can at least see each other's um, names and use the chat to converse. My name is Cindy McDonald. I am your hostess for the Friday Forums. I started these, gosh, in 2020 during the beginning of COVID. And I'm so thrilled that we've been able to continue these and have these be an ongoing source of information. My goal is to bring you experts in our field, whether it's education or in business or a combination or just somebody interesting for you to learn and listen to. And so I always welcome any suggestions or ideas that you may have and always send those to me. So Beth, you can see we've got Andrea from Long Island and Sharon from, Sharon from North Carolina, um, just Connecticut, Georgia, Brookline, Fremont, Jeffrey, I know you're probably getting tons of cool. rain up there, um, Washington, just all these wonderful things, people from all these different places. And put in your chat as you're joining us, what are you looking forward to? in 2023? What's one thing you're looking forward to? And um, it's always fun to have a new year and seeing what, what we might be able to do. Make sure as you're putting in the chat, also mm -hmm. make sure that it's coming to everyone so that it's not set just to hosts and panelists. My um, co- Anchor, my co-pilot um, here today, is Carmen Gallegos, is not able to be with us today. So, so Beth, you and I are kind of flying solo today, and we're just glad to have everybody here. Travel, Linda says travel, more organization for Andrea. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to travel, and I'm just looking forward to things opening up just a little bit more to um evaluating college curriculum. So, mm -hmm. um, so this is, as we go into the new year, we have students who are either already in college or, uh, you know, our seniors are starting to either gotten the ED ones, you know, starting to get their ED twos, and they're looking at that next step in college. What I've always told my students is as a counselor and as an advisor, and I, and I talk about this in my UCLA class as well, I'm not here to get you out of high school. I'm here to get you into college. And by that, I mean, I want you to go to college and be successful. So Beth, this is something you recognized a long time ago in terms of how to help students be successful. Um, Beth is the founder of College Navigators. She's spent 25 years coaching and mentoring undergraduate students and collegiate student athletes, which is a whole another discussion <laughs> that we can have in areas of academic advising, career development, student support at several institutions. Beth's worked for 14 years at Cornell University in both direct service and leadership roles within student development at the College of Engineering, the Hotel School, the Office of Undergraduate Biologies. Um, no prospective uh, physicians in that group at all, right? <laughs> Again, a whole other session. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So Beth graduated from honors from Ithaca College. She's a two-time NCAA national champion, academic All-American, and Hall of Fame inductee in women's soccer. Beth has an advanced degree in health and human performance and a concentration in sports psychology. And 
Her passion for working intensively and one-on-one -on -one with students, combined with her ability to navigate the ins and outs of college and universities, led you to start College Navigators. And what year did you start your College Navigators, Beth? Oh, well, welcome. Thank you, Cindy. I really appreciate appreciate the opportunity to be on here with you and for the gracious introduction. So uh, it was actually just about a year ago I made the decision to step away from my current position at Cornell and uh, left the position at the end of March and officially launched College Navigators in summer 22. Oh, wow. So so you're um, fairly new as a, as a consultant. So congratulations. I think that that um, speaks to the commitment and the passion that you have. So I shared a little bit about about a little bit about your background. Can you give us a little bit more information about um, yourself and, and your background? Sure. Well, again, thank you for the generous introduction and again, the opportunity to be here. And I only regret that I'm not going to have a chance to meet or learn from uh, many of the colleagues that are on this call. So thank you to those of uh, you that have joined today. Um, so Cindy, you know, above and beyond what you shared, I think, you know, what's important to understand is, you know, my own journey through my undergraduate education was, um, once I got to college was pretty typical, but I had some pretty intriguing options on the front end. I won't go into those, but I, you know, I was, I had the opportunity because I was an athlete. Um, I had a hook at some pretty prestigious institutions. And at the end of the day, I was fortunate enough to be supported by a family that really emphasized me going where I felt most comfortable. And we focused on affordability. And so I wouldn't trade the decision I made 30 plus years ago um, for anything in the world. And um, my first job out of college, I worked with at-risk youth for five years. So um, students, young people who were at risk of being taken out of the home. And that was really formative sort of in my professional trajectory because throughout my career, I've always gravitated towards working with the underdog, working from students with historically underserved communities and have really always tried to help my work be as transparent as possible and the institutions with which I am working with be as transparent as possible, recognizing that while all of us doing this type of work, I'm going to presume by and large we're um, working with families that come with a fair amount of privilege. Um, and as I get further into my work with college navigators, I'm really looking to find ways to offer my services to students from you know, marginalized communities and things like that. Uh, because I truly believe at the end of the day, if you take one thing away from my talk here today, I truly believe it's more about um, when students go and how they go to college than it is necessarily where they go. And um, obviously I'm sure that is a conversation that many of you that work as college counselors talk with families about from early on in the process. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like we're preaching to the choir here because right. that's what we all try to emphasize the college fit, the, you know, focusing on the student and where those connections are. But something that's a hard sell with parents mm -hmm. in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you've been working with as a professional and you've worked in some very prestigious institutions, what are some of the challenges that you notice the students running into? You know, I mean, and that's why I've always said it's not about getting out of high school because that's only part of it. When they get to college, they still need to succeed there too. So what are some things that you noticed that they were struggling with? Yeah, thank, thanks for the question. And I just want to make note, I see that Andrea put in the um, chat that she works with some economically disadvantaged students. And so, Andrea, I would love to connect with you at some point because that is foundational to the work that I want to be doing and figuring out how do you um, run a business and um, and also um, stay true to your values. So I, I'm glad to hear that. Um, so yeah, I, I, again, I've been really fortunate. I've worked at some great institutions and as a result, I've worked with many high achieving students. And I think one of the things, that, there are many variables, of course. So a lot of what I'm going to say are generalizations, but many of them come in already burned out. They come in um, potentially never having really experienced a lot of failure or having this tremendous fear of failure. They sometimes are laser focused. You mentioned those pre-health students early on, those pre-med students, you know, sometimes they're just super laser focused. They have tunnel vision. Um, I 
would go so far as to say many of them have just been so focused. They've had their eye on the prize of getting into a highly ranked institution. They don't really know who they are or really how they got there and what makes them tick. And again, I think that's probably a lot of the work you all do with these students and with their families. Um, oftentimes, particularly if they're first in their family to go to college or they're international students, there is a lot of weight on their shoulders about what their success at the institution means to not only them, but their larger community. Um, one of the other things that I've noticed is that for some of the strongest students academically in high school, they arrive at college with either very poorly developed study skills or actually really counterproductive study skills. And once they hit that more rigorous environment, uh, they really struggle to, to and realize that what they've been doing doesn't work. And yet they tend to try to study harder and not differently. And so it's just a lot of, in some ways, um, helping them unlearn a lot of the things that they were doing that got them to the institution where they are. And it's really hard. I had the, a great colleague who used to say, someone else had them for 18, 19, 20 years before they got here. And, you know, we're trying to kind of help them unlearn a lot of their ideas about who they are, how they learn, what it means to be successful. And so I, I would say those are some of the more predominant challenges, particularly with high achieving students. So I think that's interesting that um, once they, they get to their institution or their dream college, that they might have to unlearn some of those things that they mm -hmm. found to get them there. So what are some examples of things they might have to unlearn? So, you know, a lot, a lot of students, particularly high achieving students, they are so bright that they can procrastinate and they can cram. And at the end of the day, they can get their homework done the night before. They can, if, as long as they're paying attention in class, they don't necessarily need to study a whole lot in high school. Um, and that often flips tremendously in college, particularly when many faculty at the institutions um, where I've had the fortune of working, they are only going to teach a fraction of what a student needs to know in the context of the course or during the time the course is actually meeting. And they are really expecting the student to take that information, learn additional information, and then understand how to integrate it and apply it and synthesize it in often ways that aren't necessarily straightforward. And so if a student hasn't had that experience in high school, and they've, um, that can be a, a significant learning curve for them. Um, also organizationally, again, preaching to the choir, I'm sure through your own work with these students, helping them um, come up with an organizational system that helps them meet deadlines and present, you know, a, a neat work uh, the work that's been proofread. Um, and so I think helping them develop a system in college to manage themselves and become more independent. Again, we all know about the helicopter parent, the lawnmower parents, the, you know, all, all sorts of terminologies for these um, parents who take a lot of ownership over their student success. And once they get to college, whether they are located near mom and dad or not, there's a certain level of independence that just is going to be necessary for them to be successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. And and as you said in the beginning, you know, a lot of times these students have always had, you know, experienced success. They've always mm -hmm. been high achievers and then they get to college and it's the first time they might have encountered that low grade or having to manage things on their own or, you know, having situations where they can't be fixed, you know, um, and it can be quite a traumatic experience for them. So. Two other things come to mind as you sort of um, revisited those things is one is we created a session for our first year engineering students at one point called when a C is not an F. And that was really to help students get, reca get recalibrated around what grades mean and what, you know, redefining success and that sort of thing. And then the other point I wanted to make with high achieving students is sometimes they, 
they can be sex successful in a lot of different things, or they've had success in a lot of different things. So they aren't able to separate out what am I good at versus what do I really like? Or again, what makes me tick? And so sometimes for them to select a major or to refine their academic goals can be really difficult because it gets conflated around, well, I'm really good at this. So maybe I should do this, but Sometimes it's the case that doing this isn't really what gets them jazzed up. And so helping, giving them permission to really focus on what motivates them uh, can be really critical too, particularly when they, they're strong in a lot of different areas. Right. Yeah. What, what your skills are versus what your passion is, your interests can be too different. So what are some of the solutions that you found? What are things that you found have been effective um, either that institutions have done or that you have done or are doing as an, an advisor? Again, a lot of this is very much individualized and and part of the reason why I decided to launch College Navigators through no fault of institutions. They're just becoming increasingly complex. Uh, many of them are decentralized. St there have been you know, significant staffing cuts dating way back to even 2008. And so that's this is part of the reason why I decided, decided to launch College Navigators, because I think it's really hard for institutions to address these things. But I think um, working with students to develop these skills that I'm going to talk about a little bit later in terms of college readiness and executive function skills and things like that, I think are really critical. Spending time with students to truly understand how did they get to where they are? Is it where they want to be? What do they want out of this experience? And supporting them, again, as you all, I'm sure, deal with from time to time, sorting out what mom and dad want for them or what a, you know, what a, what a caregiver wants for them versus what they want for themselves and how to create their own experience. Um, manage expectations, depending upon the academic environment in which they've landed, really helping them understand what what grading looks like. Uh, many students arrive at college not, not really understanding how a GPA is calculated, what grading on a curve means. Um, you know, it's not uncommon for students in STEM disciplines to get their first uh, major exam back and score out of, on a scale of 100, score in like the 30s or 40s. And that can be demoralizing. It can get a little bit better when they realize the average is in the 30 years or 40s, because suddenly what is a clear F is scaled up to a high C or low B and still can be really demoralizing for a student. That's So I think helping set expectations, help get students get calibrated, um, getting them connected to resources. Again, I'll talk about that later. But again, it, a lot of it's really individualized and depending upon a program's orientation, obviously there is FERPA, which... I assume many, if not everyone on this call knows about, but the Fed Federal Education Rights to Privacy Act means that once a student matriculates into a college or university, their educational records are completely private. Um, therefore, college advisors and support personnel can't talk with a parent about a student's grades or academic performance without permission. And yet there are ways if programs are committed to um, supporting students, you can bring parents into the equation, have joint conversations between, you know, being present with the families and the student, help coach the student about how to have those conversations for themselves. So a lot, yeah, so and um, I'm, I'm sure, again, a lot of this is very familiar. It's just translating what you all are doing, or many of you are doing with students during the college application process, and then putting it kind of in a college context where hopefully they're gaining even more and more independence. Um, the other thing I think for some of these students is to really help them have some early wins, students who are coming to um, stressful institutions, for them to have some early wins. It's not uncommon for students during the first couple semesters, first couple weeks of the semester, for there to be a lot of rejection around joining clubs, being admitted to certain organizations. Those processes have even become really competitive. And I remember I had a, a first year brilliant young uh, biracial woman from downstate New York, um, the Catskill area. And within her first couple of days on campus, she'd been a lifeguard for, I think, like eight years, no, not eight years, six years. And you know, she was rejected from a lifeguard job on campus. 
She was um, not selected for an intramural volleyball or a soccer program. And there was one other pr program that she wasn't selected for, you know, within her first week on campus. And so, you know, we revisited her getting involved on campus in opportunities that weren't selective, but helping students kind of have some pick the low-hanging fruit, have some easy wins so that if and when things do become challenging, they have some things to fall back on that will build their confidence. I think that's really important. And I think, I know as counselors, we try to do that on the front end, you know, make sure they have a balanced list. And, and I know especially try and have them have some admissions before they get start getting those rejections for those exact mm -hmm. reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But preparing them. So what can we do? And, and I know you mentioned your um, different points. So we're going to have you share your PowerPoint here in just a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, but as advisors, you know, I think we can do things to help students before they get to college to prepare for that, you know, and, and be ready for that transition. Um, so how do you see college readiness connected to college fit, Beth? Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead, if it's okay now, to go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint, because I think in order to um, do this, share my screen. And then start my slideshow. So there, hopefully you're all seeing my slideshow. Is that all good? Um, we, we, it hasn't started yet. There we go. Now it's yeah. starting. Yep. Okay, great. So when I think about college readiness, um, you know, it, it, I think generally people tend to focus on the academics and what I have noticed over my career. And again, one of the reasons that I wanted to start College Navigators is there are a lot of non-cognitive variables. Um, some of you may be familiar with the work of, I'm going to uh, his book it, or his book is um, Beyond the Big Test and William um, Sedlicek. I'm not sure how many folks um, on this call are familiar with him, but he he sort of is known for his work around non-cognitive variables. I tend to talk about them in terms of intrapersonal and interpersonal skills. Um, but he really is the person that coined the phrase, these non-cognitive variables. And he's out of University of Maryland. And I have a handout at the end that Cindy's going to make available to everyone. And his book is referenced on there and that sort of thing. But not surprising, interpersonal skills, I think both intra and interpersonal skills have a lot to do with college readiness, in addition to students having academic skills. And so when we think about the interpersonal skills, we're obviously talking about how do students manage themselves? How do they manage their activities of daily living? How do they manage themselves in terms of executive function skills? How do they manage their own health and well being? Do they have a sense of agency and an internal locus of control? Meaning, do they feel like they um, have a lot of sort of power over situations? And then are they willing to? demonstrate help-seeking behaviors. And then the other sort of non-cognitive variable, um, as Sedlicek would refer to them as, but I prefer to think about interpersonal skills. And this is how do students deal with other people? <laughs> um, how do they communicate? How do they interact? Uh, do they have experience with conflict management? Do they know how to compromise and collaborate? What's their level of empathy? Are they able to develop healthy relationships? Which I know, you know, we, I haven't even mentioned the word COVID. Um, all of what I'm talking about obviously existed long before COVID. And I think COVID has just exacerbated the need for families to really think about these non-cognitive variables in terms of college readiness. Um, and I think the healthy relationships, one, maybe more so than other, you know, these students who were isolated, who missed out on really significant key high school events and milestones and things like that, not to mention, you know, some of the cognitive deficiencies and challenges uh, that students are entering college with. I think those are uh, important as well. So these are what I consider to be the college readiness skills above and beyond the academics. I'm not even going to touch on the academics because I think those are, you know, well-known and 
Um, there, I wanted to just stop sharing for a minute. Well known, and often the, the area of focus. Again, I imagine in all of your work, you're talking with students about these things. These are the things that I think colleges and universities are often trying to get at with the students' writing samples and their letters of recommendations and things like that. But when push comes to shove, my experience has, has been most admissions communities are going to focus on the academic acumen of a student in terms of making admissions decisions. And I think that's that's very true. Um, and all of these things have existed before COVID, but in many ways, you know, COVID has exacerbated them. Um, and so, but the other aspect of this that has become very more pronounced over the last two years, it's been a growing concern in our industry for a long time and working with students and that's student mental health. Mm -hmm. So how is college readiness? Is it tied to student mental health? Yeah, so huge question, right? And I, it's so important for me to preface my response by, you know, I am not a mental health clinician, you know, I'm not a licensed psychologist, mental health professional or anything like that. And I also think it's important to differentiate between, you know, we all know that mental health issues for all of us are on the rise and they're particularly on the rise for our children. And so what I think is, you know, we, we, we know there are students that arrive on college campuses already diagnosed with a learning difference or some sort of psychological issue. Obviously those issues, their support for those issues varies in level, you know, from campus to campus and I'm sure all of you work diligently with those students to make sure that they are, whenever possible, applying to schools that are going to have the resources to support them with their known issues in terms of how they're managing those. And, and yet what we do know um, is there is a rise of newly diagnosed mental health issues once students arrive on campus. And from my perspective, the challenge becomes just because a student is stressed or depressed or experience a certain level of anxiety or things like that, they may benefit from therapy as we all know it and medication and a full, and there are a lot of other things that institutions can do to support that student. I think one of the things that I really commend Cornell for is how they've taken really a public health approach to mental health, meaning everyone in the community kind of has a responsibility to support students. And certainly if a student is lacking in these areas of college readiness, any of the areas, right? Academic skills, intrapersonal skills, or interpersonal skills, it's understandable that they're going to experience a certain amount of stress or anxiety or challenge when certain situations arise in college, whether those lead to, you know, diagnosable mental illness or issues that need to be treated by a mental health professional. Certainly in many situations they do. And in other situations, working with a mentor or closely with an advisor finding a community of support, getting involved in different support groups or um, ident uh, student groups on campus with certain affinity groups and that, those sorts of things can often go a long way in helping a student enhance those skills, particularly the interpersonal and interpersonal. Of course, many college campuses have learning centers and I think colleges are really good about thinking about what do we do to support students that have academic deficits or to help enhance academic skills once a student comes to campus? Um, they may not be staffed well enough to provide mm -hmm. them at the level that many students need. I think where it becomes increasingly difficult for a whole host of reasons, many of which are not the institution's fault, is helping students develop these intrapersonal and interpersonal skills once they land on a college campus. 
So many of us are going to be visiting those mm -hmm. college campuses. You know, this is the time of year where we go out and visit and people have mentioned about, you know, Liz says she's going to go visit 23 schools. So are there questions wow, cool. that we can, yeah, she's got a, I know she, she's got an, uh, an ambitious uh, that's um, awesome. agenda there. That's yeah, that's great. Well, if you come up to Ithaca, Liz, look me up. I'll treat you to lunch <laughs> or coffee or so are there questions or things we should be looking for or asking the colleges that, so that we can help find those, you know, the academic, you're talking about the academic, the interpersonal and the intrapersonal. Yeah, so. it's a great question. And so I made some notes about this. Um, you know, I think you're obviously you're all really aware about institutional fit, right? I'm sure it's <laughs> what you try to spend the bulk of your time on with the students and the families that you're working with. Um, but, you know, I think there is this misconception, maybe more so um, by families than professionals in the field, that all institutions provide a certain level of support. I mean, that's where that's where they think their tuition dollars are going, right? Their tuition dollars are going to pay the faculty and for all of these co-curricular, extracurricular activities that colleges and universities tout that they have. So, you know, what I think is really, as much as you can glean for many families, I think it's really helpful to understand, you know, and, and I'm biased, right? Because my background is in advising and student support. So I automatically think about asking, you know, what is their advising philosophy? What is their advising structure? Uh, as many of you well know, uh, faculty on many college campuses are part of this uh, tenure and promotion process. And by and large, and again, I'm generalizing here, by and large, the research, the tenure and promotion process is largely based on a faculty member's research mm -hmm. in terms of publications and dollars that they're bringing in. And these are you know, typically large art research one institutions. And then teaching is secondary. And then service tends to be third, of which advising and mentoring is only a fraction. So what I'd say, if you're going to one of these big, large research one institutions, really find out about who's supporting the undergraduate students on campus and what is the level of staffing of those offices to which you're being pointed as kind of being the people feet on the ground in the trenches with these students. I think that's really uh, key to flush out, you know, to, important to flush out. Um, the other thing I would, you know, would suggest is getting a sense of, is it a decentralized university or a centralized university? So I've worked at both where, Cindy, you and I are back for first semester roommates. You're studying English. I'm studying engineering. Um, it gets to be middle of the semester and I want to drop a class. And and you decide you're going to change a class to pass fail. Um, who do you go to for information? Who do I go to for information? Are those two people in the same office? Do those people carry the same title on campus? Are we in the, under the same policy and procedures for those two transactions? Because you may find that certain colleges and universities while under one umbrella name, depending upon the academic program and depending upon how they're structured, the policies and procedures and structures may be very different depending upon the program to which a student is enrolled, the major he or she is pursuing. And so I think, and I'm getting in the weeds a little bit here, but I think that's really important, uh, particularly at your larger institutions, because who do students turn to for advice and guidance? Their peers. <laughs> and so if we're all kind of under the same umbrella and we're talking the same language and we're going and visiting people in the same offices, that's a different scenario than, uh, you know, the, us going to different offices, having a different advising structures, things like that. Um, and so I would say that that would be, important to sort of glean. Um, I'm trying to think. I I wrote down a whole list of, of things that I thought would be helpful for you all to think about. Um, and some of these will be in the handouts that I, um, that Cindy will be sharing afterwards. 
Yeah. So the handouts will be posted to the Friday Forum um, show notes, and you'll be able to go to those and download those and use those. And, and I think having those resources, having a way to open that conversation, I think we need to have those conversations with our students and the parents before they go off to college, because by the time you see them on campus, you know, they've already, there's probably already a trigger or something that's happened that made them stop and go, oh my gosh, you know, this is not what I expected. I need some help. And if we can help them get prepared beforehand and teaching, and, and it goes back to teaching some of those college readiness skills. Um, one of the programs that many people know I've been involved in AVID, which is a program in the schools. It's an international program that started here in California, but we start teaching students and they're underrepresented students um, college readiness skills early on. We teach them things like how to take Cornell notes mm -hmm. uh, so that they, and most students are never taught how to take notes you know, and so they don't have a way of organizing the information that they're getting or to quiz themselves or to reflect on it. And so we, we teach that through AVID. We teach them how to study tutorials. And it's not about coming up with the right answer. It's about being able to, you know, think about things and um, synthesize it and come up with questions mm -hmm. and just you know, how to keep a calendar, all those kinds of things. Um, you know, if you've never done that and you've been able to wing it all the way through high school, as you, as we all know, many of these high achieving students do, and then they hit a wall. Um, sometimes we see that in high school when they go from regular classes to AP or mm -hmm. IB, you know, mm -hmm. they, they hit that same wall, but helping them to be ready for that and, um, and helping them to be, um, prepared ahead of time can make such a difference. Now, you've given us some ideas in terms of things to ask at the colleges. Um, how does that relate to that? How does college readiness connect to college fit? So mm -hmm. if I ask a college these questions or have my students and parents ask them these questions and the answers come back, how do I know whether that's going to work for me or not? So when you say work for you, like, is it going to be a good fit? Like if the advising is decentralized, is that going to be a good fit or do I need a centralized? So I have one person to go to. So yeah, how does college fit and college readiness connect? Yeah, I think, right. Big um, loaded question. Um, and I mean, I think it's about how well the parent knows their student, how well the student knows him or herself, how well you all get to know the student. And I think if you glean that your student is more advanced with some of these intrapersonal and interpersonal skills, and they've been tested and challenged, then they are likely to be more capable of managing a larger institution that's decentralized where there, you know, there may not be, you know, um, freshman housing, or there may not be a first year transition program, or, you know, there may not be a summer bridge program or things like that. So I think it comes down to really thinking about as you work with students, and as much as you can encourage the parents to think beyond the academic piece, because again, I and again, I, I I'm biased, but I feel like there's just and I've read admissions, I've read admissions part time for I'm not doing it now, but I, I did it for five or six years. I've read applications, and there is a my experience was there's this overemphasis on academics, and so as much as you all in your conversations with these families as early as possible. Um, if you're working with ninth and 10th graders, you know, and also ex ha help them experience some parallel scenarios that they may experience once they get into these institutions. If you know you have a student that is shooting to go to, you know, Ivy Plus or a top 20 school, um, empower them, encourage their parents to try to get them into situations that are uncomfortable in which they fail and throughout that process, help the family redefine what success and failure looks like. Um, one of the things 
I do a lot of work with my families on now is I try to de-emphasize the importance of grades. Uh, you all know that once you get to college, there are certain professions going back to maybe the pre-health students, um, and even them, med schools are engaging in a much more holistic process. But you know, by and large, um, and I don't know what the statistic is, but I'm sure you all know, increasing numbers of tech companies, they aren't even looking at GPAs. They are really looking at a lot of these non-cognitive variables or these, you know, interpersonal and intrapersonal. Certainly you have to have a baseline level of competence and aptitude, but a lot of times um, if parents are so focused on the next step after college, like I want my kid to go to college X because I know once they graduate from college X, they'll be they'll be able to go to you know this med school or this grad school, or they'll be able to go to work for one of the big five consulting firms, or they're going to go work for a Google or a Microsoft or an Amazon. And what I think the more that we can help families understand that if you focus on these non-cognitive variables, most likely the grades are going to come. The, the performance is going to increase. Um, People tend to gravitate towards looking at grades, I think, in college because it's quantifiable, right? It's something you can put a number on, you can put a letter on, and you it's you can't put a number on these other skills that are becoming increasingly important. So I'd say as much as you all can help families really think about what success looks like, encourage parents to focus on behaviors rather than outcomes. Um, particularly in college, particularly in some of these larger institutions that grade on a curve, a student's final grade is not always dependent on his or her mastery alone. It, it's dependent upon how their colleagues do, how their peer group goes. If things are graded on a curve, you know, so all that student really can control is what he or she does. Um, increase their level of self-awareness, their willingness to seek help. Um, particularly high achieving students, they've always been the tutors. They mm -hmm. probably perceive staying after class or staying after school to kind of be a punishment, like going to the principal's office. Whereas in college, the students that get ahead are the students that go to office hours. They form relationships with faculty. And so the more that students get comfortable with doing those things in high school, I think the more successful they will be when they go to college. And I know a lot of high school advisors, both in the schools as counselor or, you know, as an independent, are really helping students to look at that and think about that and experience those things because it is true. I mean, oftentimes the very first time a student suffered any kind of rejection at all is when they first get their first college denial letter, you yeah. know, and we want to incur, you know, we want them to experience that within an environment that we can help them manage the, the reaction and the disappointment and things like that. Um, but Beth, I'm wondering, is there a way, like, are there assessments or ways that we can determine how a student, prepared a student is in the, especially, I mean, the academic, as you said, that's easy. We can look at their classes and their, their um, grades and, you know, that's pretty easy, but the interpersonal and the interpersonal, are there other ways that we can determine, um, get a sense of where they fall on that? Are there, I certainly wished there were, and I, I'm not aware that Sedlicek does have kind of an assessment and instrument out there. It's pretty, um, pretty, I'm, and it's paper, pencil, it's kind of antiquated, that sort of thing. Um, there, I think some schools have developed their own. I think I found one that's available at a nursing school. I feel like there's maybe a school in Massachusetts that has come up with some sort of assessment, but I I think the, the cool thing is, unlike when I was sitting on a college campus and largely working with this student who I knew little about and who was in a foreign environment where no one else knew them, is when you're all working with high school students, they, by and large, I most of them, I assume, are in a community of people with whom they're relatively familiar. And so... Uh, it looks like somebody does have a suggestion. It looks like Eric said, found mm -hmm. that using an approach outlined, find the perfect college fit. By Claire Law okay. and Russell and Marie, who are both independent um, consultants. And, okay. Oh, and that'd Claire be interesting. Law, 
Yeah, she's actually a really good friend of mine. And okay. she uses a Meyer Briggs approach, mm-hmm. gives the call, and, and we actually had that in Guided Path as well. Um, so it's a Meyer Briggs approach where the students identify their personality mm-hmm. and then find that same kind of character in the colleges. Um, so there are, you know, I think there are tools and resources that we can use. Um, another thing that I'll put a link into the show notes is um, Dr. Stephen Antonoff and I have done sessions a number of times on assessments, and and there are as uh, there's assessments that we can use. And I don't know if anybody knows any off the top of their heads. I see Please. Renee's got Achieve Works. Um, they, yeah, there's an intelligence, and there's and there are assessments out there about interpersonal and intrapersonal, um, but I'll put a link to that assessment. It's just an annotated list and people can use it. Maybe I'll pull out some of the, the other things. Um, another person that I would mention and, and then I'm, I've had in my Friday forum before and I'll, I'll um, try and see if I can get him in the next year is Harlan Cohen. So anybody who's read The Naked Roommate you know, Harlan is all about transition, and he's done a lot more work um, in that area. He talks about how students should have three themes. They should be looking for people where they can feel comfortable, get connected, you know, and it goes to what you're saying about finding the resources, the writing center, the math lab, you know, being comfortable with that. So people, and also just people that they can connect with, places where they can be comfortable, you know, the biology lab or the climbing gym or whatever that is. So people, places, and the last thing is patience having patience that when you go to college, it is going to be uncomfortable. I think part of the thing that our students experience is like, they feel like once they get out of high school, their whole high school trajectory has been pointed at this pinnacle Mm -hmm. of I am going to college. I'm going to go to, you know, X, Y, Z college, however prestigious you see it. And a lot of that's dependent on, you know, where you're located. And then when you get there, you've reached that pinnacle like now what do I do? Yep. And they don't, they don't, they expect it to be this perfect place and all is going to be rosy and they don't expect to be uncomfortable. And so Harlan talks about being comfortable with the uncomfortable, just yeah. having patience that you, you know, you're going to, it's going to be an adjustment and it's not instantaneously the perfect, you know, place. So, um, so we've got, so you can see we've got Achieve Works people are putting in here. Use Science is another one. You know, Hildy talks about being comfortable with uncomfortable. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's one of the things that connects back to our point about mental health too. And if we can do that, the more we can help students prepare for those kinds of things, then that will help them have sustain their mental health not only in high school, but as they get to college and then go on to graduate school or medical school or law school or whatever, you know, their trajectory can be. So I think there's just so much that we can do. Um, Cindy, I want to, if you don't mind, I want to pick up on a couple of things that you said. I totally agree. I think And depending on how much contact you all have with the parents, I know this is one of the things whenever I had the opportunity to participate in first look programs or spring visits or orientation is to really talk to the parents about um, resist the temptation to um, play this up too much, that these are going to be the best years of your lives and that sort of thing. Because for a lot of students, it's a really rocky start. And for many students, they won't necessarily be the best years of their lives. Um, And to again kind of norm the parents around just because your you know your child may call really upset or says they failed something you know please remember students are going to gravitate back towards the people that they know know them and they feel secure with so don't assume that because your student calls home and is crying that things all, all things are bad and miserable and you need to yank them out and bring them home or um, that when they say they failed, try to put it into a context. Um, you all know, I'm sure this happens in high school. And for those of you that have worked on college campuses or have children of VR and you know, 
particularly during that first semester and first year on campus, everyone's trying to play cool with each other. So everyone, I worked once worked at an institution where we kind of coined the phrase effortless perfection. So everyone was kind of like, all the students were like, oh yeah, it's, it's easy. I'm doing great. Things are fine. Um, and yet most of them, you know, we're not, they were experiencing some challenges, some disappointment, things like that, but they're trying to play off, you know, each other. And, um, and there's, for me, there was few brighter moments when a, one of a student would be leaving my office and another student would be coming into the office and they would see each other and they'd be like, wait, you're talking to Beth. Oh, cool. Can, will you stick around? Let's go grab a cup of coffee. And it kind of normalizes. So again, I, I think talking, whenever you all have the chance to talk with families around some of these things, um, it will benefit the student because those of us on college campuses, once their parents leave them at the door, it's really difficult for us to um, engage the parents around, you know, managing expectations and norming some behaviors and things like that. So, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I totally agree. You know, as Hildy says, you know, it's, uh, you know, they've been, or Elizabeth said, they've been told all their lives. It's the best days of their lives. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. Um, not necessarily. And if you're someone like me, I went to three institutions in three different years. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, they were all very different though. One was a large public university, one was a small private women's college, and then I ended up at a small liberal arts university. And you know, it, it, they were, they were very, very different experiences. And I think that goes back to the college readiness and the college fit. So I love people. So if people have be articles, mm -hmm. if they have links to these programs. Um, you know, please share those. Um, boy, Liz has got all sorts of um, things that she's putting in. Nice. So um, this is great. Yeah, the W curve model. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think, oh, shoot, you just said something that reminded me and now it's gone. Well, and um, we just have a few more minutes. So yeah. if anybody has any questions, I see no open questions at the moment, Beth. So, um, so the, and, and Hildy's talking about grit. And that was the other thing that I wanted to, to bring up. And, and it's been great seeing that research by Carol Dweck about, mm -hmm. you know, open mindset, growth mindset, and fixed mindset and helping our students to develop those because so many high achieving students come from that fixed mindset mm -hmm. and um, helping them to change it and adjust it to, you know, just like seeing a C as a growth opportunity and not as a failure. I just think that's so, so important. Um, that's, um, so as anybody has, we just have a couple more minutes. If you have any questions, now is the time to ask. If somebody wants to get a hold of you, Beth, how do they find you? So, uh, well, if you're in, first of all, if you're in Ithaca, Syracuse, upstate New York, please don't hesitate to look me up. Um, I'd love to, like I said, buy coffee. Um, I'm going to put for you folks, I'm going to give you my um, personal Gmail. Um, also, my business email is on my website. My website is www.college-navigators.com. Um, my, uh, I can't type and type and talk at the same time. Um, there is my personal Gmail. Um, please feel free to reach out to me. One other thing I wanted to point because it did it didn't come up in terms of, um, and Cindy, obviously you have a great example at, of colleges aren't going anywhere. Well, some may actually, some are actually quite vulnerable right now, but by and large, an opportunity for a student to get a college education is not going anywhere. And so if a student gets to an institution and it's not working, they can take a leave of absence and try out another institution. They can take a leave of absence to focus on their health. And one of the things I always encourage families to do is if, a and it's very hard to do, but if a student needs to take some, take a, take a step off the treadmill attend to some health issues, focus on your health issues. Don't focus on getting back to school because that can distort what the focus is and what they avail themselves to and how open they are. And so I think that's another thing is obviously, um, depending upon how much contact you all have with students once they get in and once they leave to college, I, it, my sense is I it, it might vary quite significantly uh, from person to person, but um, yeah, um, just encourage students to take care of themselves. The college education will always be there. And um, average age of students going to medical school now is like 26. 
Um, I think the current, I don't know what the current statistic is, but when I was working in engineering, there was a statistic out there that 60% of the jobs the current college students would hold during their career didn't even exist at the time in which those students, Mm -hmm. things are just changing so rapidly. And so uh, gap years, glide years, you know, growth years, I think are great opportunities. Yeah. I, I, I think so too. And that, that is a whole nother conversation that we can have. And I'll definitely um, put that into our Friday forums for 2023. And I think that, um, you know, all of this, all, everything that we all do, it all connects together. And that's why I love having these conversations because we, we're working on both sides and we're all focused on helping our students to be the very best they can and have those best experiences. So um, that is the, having the conversations on all sides of the desk is what really helps. Uh, I was going to share one of my, going back to what you were just saying, Beth, um, one of my UCLA students who works at a pretty prestigious university was sharing with us in class that she had one of the student applicants had and was from another country and he wrote about how he was looking for the health and started becoming fascinated with birds in his community and then mm-hmm. noticed that they were were suffering and then looked into what was going on and then developed um you know, kind of built an awareness of how to help the health of the birds. And it wasn't, he didn't do it because he was academic. He didn't do it because mm-hmm. it would look good. He didn't do it any other reason than he was interested. Yeah. And, you know, and and so for a gap year or anything like that, doing it for the right reasons or being in any kind of activity for the right reasons is really going to show. Yeah. And so often it's... um Oftentimes our students don't realize how those individual things that they've done do show those skills and and strengths and and can build on them. I um, I have a student right now who's teaching her friends how to sew. How wonderful is that? You know, it's just something that that she started doing. And and so, but she doesn't think that's a big deal. I think, well, I think you know, that's something you can really write about and and prepare. So, so that's what our job is, is to help our students find that. And I really like to, that you're talking about talking to parents. Mm -hmm. So often we try to leave parents out of the equation. They're, they're pushy, they are demanding and all these (laughs) things, but they need, parents need to hear these messages from us just as much as their students do, and sometimes even more. And I know a lot of consultants are now offering webinars for their parents, a Q&A where the parents can come in and they can help address these things and, you know, get them um, those discussions going. And I think that's important too. So well, if anyone you. on this call is, is doing those types of presentations and I can lend a hand in that or contribute anything from having been on the other side, I would love to do that. Cause at the end of the day, the, my sole motivation for doing this is to really help emerging adults, adults have, you know, fulfilling college experiences. And so. So do I feel a book in the office? Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I You're going to help me write it. Let's do one in tandem. <laughs> <laughs> I know. No kidding. Well, everyone, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much for being here. And thank you everyone for taking time out in your, um, in January. Be watching for emails in two weeks. I'm going to, ha- we'll be back for our next Friday forum. We're going to have John Burdick from Cornell University, the vice provost, and he's going to talk about um, race and missions in the Supreme Court. So that should be a very good um, discussion. And I'm going to have Peter Van Buskirk back in February and, and covering all these different topics. I'm also going to be starting to offer some uh, free workshops and some paid workshops. So watch your calendar. I'll put these out there. I'm going to do one on name your price workshop. One of the things this will be next week, people all the time say, how do I set up my pricing? And I find we do it the total opposite of the way we should do it. So if you want to have a workshop, um, I'm going to do a uh, name your price workshop on the 12th. Um, they're a three hour workshop that's a paid workshop, but I'm doing one on the top five 
mistakes that consultants make, that's a free one. And I'll be doing a technology one. So I'm getting all those dates put together. I'll send those out to you guys and plus all the Friday forums. So Beth, thank you again for being no, my thank guest you. Today. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks everybody for hopping on. And I hope to meet some of you at some point in time. So be in touch anytime. I eager to be helpful. Oh, well, you certainly were. You gave us a <laughs> lot of um, information and thanks everybody for being here. And I will see you again at our next Friday forum or workshop in between.